everybody, and welcome to today's Strategic Farming Let's Chop Crop, crop section. Um, we're happy that you joined us today for today's session, and we're going to focus on cover crops, looking at termination timing and planting green, but also we got quite a number of questions uh, at registration here about cover crops. So we'll, we'll fill in those uh, questions as well as, as we can. Um, and again, these sessions are brought to you by, of course, the University of Minnesota Extension, but also generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. Uh, I'm Liz Stahl. I'm an extension educator in crops. I work in southwestern Minnesota out of the Worthington Regional Extension Office. And I'd like to welcome our speakers today. We have Dr. Axel Garcia Garcia. He's an associate professor in sustainable cropping systems at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center by Lamberton. And then Dr. Anna Cates, she's our U of M Extension State Soil Health Specialist. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Garcia Garcia first and uh, just see what he wants to address a few of the comments here and some of the research that he's been doing um, and looking at, you know, what do we need to have cover crops to successfully, you know, grow and establish in Minnesota. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, uh, as Lee said, I, uh, I am Axel Garcia Garcia. I am an agronomist in the Department of Agronomy and uh, Plant Genetics. Uh, my primary workplace is the Southwest Research and Outreach Center. Uh, I'm really very glad to, to be here and uh, very glad as well to see that uh, we receive lots of questions regarding cover crops. Uh, yeah, in Minnesota, that's great. Uh, I hope we can address some of those questions with, with Anna, Liz, and others. Um, please uh, feel free to discuss uh, whatever you, you wish we, we have to discuss today. Well, this is the thing. I've been working with cover crops uh, since 2015, uh, mostly in the corn and soybean rotation, okay? I've done research that has been supported by the corn growers and the soybean growers, as well as uh, state and federal funds. And um, we've seen really cover crops, uh, you know, use increase in the state since I've been here, <clears throat> but not at the pace that we would like to see it. So we are still quite behind uh, in terms of acreage uh, with cover crops in the state. And there are several, several issues why that. Uh, one of the issues, obviously, from farmers' perspective, from with some I have talked with, is that uh, they don't see the immediate, you know, uh, economic benefits on the use of cover crops. Well, uh, but tied to that, and probably the primary reason why cover crops uh, are still not, you know, taking off in the state is because it's a practice that is not that simple for our conditions. In Minnesota, uh, our growing season is pretty short. We get really cold very quickly and uh, our cold season lasts for several months as, as most of you know better than I do. So as a result of that, uh, it is very difficult for us to grow cover crops because uh, the window opportunity for those cover crops to, to produce biomass is very short. So imagine that uh, we are trying to put cover crops in the corn and soybean rotation. At the time corn and soybean have been harvested, basically we don't have too much time for those crops, uh, cover crops to grow in, uh, in the fall. As a result, you know, uh, biomass production uh, before uh, frost or at frost, let's say, is pretty marginal. And so the benefits we, look, we are looking at in terms of uh, cover crops use is also marginal in the fall. These, these are the underlying main issues for cover crops uh, growth in the state. Uh, but then uh, you see, we have a, let's say a regular uh, corn and soybean growing season. It looks like this uh, green box here. So, so what are the opportunities for us to establish cover crops here? The first one is, if we try to establish cover crops at the end of the season, either before corn and soybean planting or uh, harvesting or right after harvest, whichever comes, the result is that uh, by the end of the season, because of the frost uh, time, uh, we have not produced enough biomass yet. So, but let's say if we have a, a winter kill cover crop, we are done here, basically. There is not much we can do after that. But if we have a, a, a winter hardy cover crop, that cover crop will continue growing in the next season, okay? But the thing here is that by the time we had to plant corn and soybeans, it means that we should have already terminated those cover crops, which is 
around the 20th, 25th of April. So by then, again, the biomass that was produced by, by those cover crops is still very low. Uh, what if we let those cover crops growing a little bit more? So we go somewhere here, which is already into the growing season of corn and soybeans, and then we plant uh, the cash crops. The thing is that we've seen that the month of May is key for cover crops growth in the state, okay? If we provide, let's say, three weeks of May, which is pretty much impossible when we are talking on corn and soybeans for, but if we provide those three weeks for cover crops to grow, we will basically duplicate and even almost triplicate the amount of biomass that is produced. I am saying that if we terminate cover crops by the end of April, we are talking about less than 1,000 pounds of uh, dry mass biomass per acre. But if we terminate those cover crops around the 20th or 18th of May, we are talking on even 3,500 pounds of dry mass per acre. That's a considerable amount of biomass that also, it, it, that amount of biomass reflects on the quality of the benefits that we are looking at for, from the use of cover crops. And then there is another option, which is to intercede cover crops early in the season, let those cover crops grow until uh, you know the end of the season when we we harvest cash crops. Uh, whatever is the, the the method we use to have cover crops in the corn and soybean rotation, uh, biomass is the key thing. We have to make sure that we provide enough time for that those cover crops to grow. And I've been showing this graph several in in many of my talks, and basically it tells us that during the fall, for us to have enough biomass, we should be planting cover crops around, uh, let's say not later, probably than mid to 20th of August. So we'll be talking about 2000, even 2,500 pounds of dry mass per acre. That's in the fall. So, but the thing is that for corn and soybeans, we are talking on harvesting and eventually trying to plant somewhere here. And this uh, shaded area here is when we are seeding cover crops in our experiments. You can see that we produce very, very low, very little biomass, uh, less than 1,000. And finally, uh, before I stop talking, uh, you can see here that no matter when we are planting uh, our cover crops, uh, it will make a difference in terms of the amount of biomass and the growth that we are going to have before the end of the season. But if we were producing for grain, this is uh, cereal rye, you can see that uh, by the end of July, we will have already uh, a lot of uh, degree days accumulated. But we have to terminate it here when basically there is not much yet. But an option that we've been talking and we are trying to come up with some, uh, some sort of results about is planting green. If we plant green, it means that instead of terminating the cover crop here, we're gonna give those cover crops the chance to grow a little bit more. And then yes, we will have enough biomass for what we are looking at. So I, I can keep talking about these things, but uh, the point I wanna make today is that cover crops need and we should give them an opportunity to grow. Uh, and that probably it changes from one location to another, but it might be a couple of weeks, it might be more, it might be less. Uh, it depends on several factors. But basically, uh, if, we, uh, if we can terminate cover crops, uh, you know, in May, let's say by mid-May, that would be probably optimum for us, but it depends on how the cash crop is going to fit into such a practice. So that said, I guess I'm gonna pass it to, to Anna, who is also going to talk a little bit about other interesting things on cover crops in the state. Thank you. Yes, Anna, if you wanna share some, I know you've been doing on-farm work uh, and yeah. have a lot of interesting things to show, show too, kind of the benefits from the soil health perspective. So. Yeah, so I just put this up because I, I wanted to emphasize that I am a soil scientist, uh, primarily not an agronomist, and I'm mostly interested in cover crops to talk about what they do with the soil. But the first stuff I'm going to talk about is, is just related to what Axel talked about in terms of what can we get from cover crops across the state. 
And I use this app that Melissa Wilson's lab has made public. It's similar to the Canopio app that other people have used, but it, it takes a photo like this of the ground and estimates how much green cover you have there. So in this case, it's like, okay, you've got about you know half the ground covered with greenness. Over here, you've got a little bit more covered with greenness. So it's a way of estimating how well your cover crops are succeeding without taking the biomass samples and drying it down. And so we're able to do this because I'm cooperating with a lot of soil and water conservation districts who are collecting a lot of data on cover crop planting methods, species, dates, et cetera, um, in the counties I have listed here. So thanks to everybody who went out and took these pictures and entered in their data. Here, I'm just showing essentially the same point that Axel made, that your percent green cover, so this estimate of cover crop success goes down as you plant later in the fall. And you can see that that's pretty consistent across counties. I wouldn't say it's, it's a more uh, drastic drop off for any of them with the data we have right now. The fall and the spring panels here refer to pictures taken in the fall and pictures taken in the spring. So as you'll see in the next slide, these spring ones are, are overwintered cover crops, whereas this include both overwintered and winter killed cover crops. The other cool thing I think you can see here is the difference between 2020 data, which are the circles and this lower slope and 2021 data, which are the triangles in this higher slope. We actually had a pretty good fall last year for establishing cover crops. And I've talked to growers this year who are a little nervous about how successful their cover crops have been uh, over the fall of 2021 and, and looking at maybe a little earlier termination spring of 2022, because presumably they've already gotten to that height of biomass that Axel is thinking about in terms of getting the benefits we want. So the other way to look at this data is by species, and uh, it's the same but dots, just color coded differently, and you can see um, the cereal rye is mostly what we're looking at for cover crops that survive the winter. I wanted to see whether this spread and the success of rye had to do with the seeding method. And uh, so this figure shows that, although the points are a little bit smaller, but drill seeding is a little square, broadcast or triangles, broadcasting corporations, um, are the square and drill is actually the cross. So when I look at this, I'm seeing that for the fall seed, the, um, the fall growth, the drilling um, kind of sticks out as a more effective seeding method. I know this was one of the questions that came up and this, is, this fits in with research that Liz and Axel have done over the years too, but getting that good seed to soil contact generally leads to a better establishment. And especially if you're looking at a species that's gonna winter kill, um, that's really critical. The other kind of neat thing this data set lets us look at is actually how much growth are you getting over the winter. And this is just looking at cereal rye. And the way you can read this is here is a, a, a picture taken in the fall with the little um, uh, circle. And then the picture taken in the uh, spring is the triangle. So that's how much it grew over the course of the year. This particular field didn't grow very much, but like this field went from 25% ground cover all the way up to like 80 or 90% ground cover. So there's a real variation in how much ground cover was achieved over that winter growing season is what I'm seeing. Anyway, that gets to some of these questions about what do we need to do to make cover crops successful? Do we want to address anything else about that, Axel? I have some stuff to share about soil biological tests and um, uh, yield stability, but we can talk about that later too. Yeah, uh, I, I guess when it comes to discussion of uh, all the questions we have, probably we can address some of that, but yeah, that it would be good to, to, to discuss as much as we can these things. Yeah, so I mean, just looking at some of the questions and some of the questions that are coming in too, um, I've kind of addressed this, but yeah, what, what do you think are some of the best establishment methods and, you know, what have you seen as most consistently? And we've also had questions about species a lot of times too, if you want to elaborate any on those. Well, uh, when it comes to establishment, uh, I, I would probably ask uh, which uh, cash crops are we talking about here and also where are the enterprise is located uh, and those kind of things. But generally speaking, um, and I can say that, uh, let's say for corn and soybeans, which is mostly what I do, uh, there are different ways we can uh, successfully establish cover crops. In the case of soybeans, uh, we have done research where we try to establish cover crops uh, um, at the end of the season before, before uh, soybean is harvested. And we do that by uh, broadcasting seeds uh, 
at more or less R7, R8 soybeans growth stages, which is close to maturity, when they start to just uh, get yellowish and drop the leaves, uh, and also after harvest soybeans. Uh, those are the two ways we can get cover crops established, established uh, following soybeans. As for corn, we have done at uh, all the way to V8 corn, but the V4, V6 it seems to be a good a, a good fit. And then late in the season at R5, R6 corn, which is close to maturity as well. And obviously after harvesting corn, that that will be those will be you know some ways to get uh, cover crops established uh, following corn and soybeans. The other thing is that um, if we do it after corn harvest, the the sooner we seed cover crops, the better it's going to be. Uh, and the thing is, we already have uh, research results that show that uh, when we are seeding cover crops uh, not later than around the 20th of September, our biomass production in the in the spring is gonna is gonna be uh, substantially higher than uh, air, uh, later cover uh, planting cover crops in the fall. And last but not least, uh, if we don't have time, you know, to plant early enough. Let's go ahead and we can plant in the case of cereal rye, we can plant even uh, very, very late in the season. It is not going to emerge in the fall, but certainly will emerge in the spring and it will be fine. Okay, that's yeah, so that establishment and I want to get to that soil health questions with you too, Anna, soon, but I, I do think we do need to, uh, you know, since we talked about planting green here as well, I mean, Axel, I know we've done some, you know, work on planting green. Do you want to share a little bit what we've found so far on that? You know, what, what have you found with planting green? Are there, you know, what kind of trade-offs have you seen? Uh, are there yield impacts potentially? Um, yeah. Know, corn or soybeans? Well, just to, to be in the same page, uh, planting green it means planting the cash crop uh, into standing cover crop when the cover crop is still growing. Uh, and the main reason why we are doing that in our case here in Minnesota is because we are trying to provide cover crops that window opportunity for growth. So by planting green, what we have done is the first study we did actually with, with Ulysses was uh, to plant uh, uh, corn and soybeans into standing uh, cereal rye uh, cover crop. And then we waited uh, some days before we terminated the cover crop. Okay. That didn't go well for corn. Uh, corn yield was substantially and significantly reduced. But what happened, what happened in that experiment is that we planted corn and we kept corn on their growing cereal rye for around four to six days, I guess, if I recall properly. And as a result, uh, corn was... Uh, was did not grow well and yield was considerably reduced. To our surprise, however, soybean did it, did it very well. Soybean uh, was just in terms of yield was just as good as our control, which was with no cover crop. Then in our second year, uh, what we did was we planted only, uh, we planted green corn only, and uh, we let the cover crop grow all the way to May 18th. And, uh, and then we, t we terminated also another, tr another treatment was terminated the cover crop a, a week before May 18th and we let it on the field, the residue, and we planted then on 18th. Uh, this result was very interesting because both uh, the planting green and the terminated earlier cover crop uh, were fine in terms of corn yield. Of course, corn yield was slightly reduced, but was not as much. So the bottom line here is that we, our Copper crop biomass was really very, very, very good, but we are still in need of more research. So we make sure that uh, this practice is not really, uh, is not going to really affect uh, the yield of corn. It looks like for soybean, we are good to go. Yeah, and that's kind of what other uh, universities further north have seen as well, just kind of that general trend that 
yeah, there's a little more risk with corn, but soybeans tend to uh, handle it pretty well. You know, of course, it depends on the year, of course. But, you know, again, we're looking at planting green to optimize biomass. Um, you guys want to address, like, why are we so focused on biomass? What, what does it matter? And how much biomass do we really need? I don't know if you want to take a stab at that first, Anna. Um, but, you know, again, what, how much do we really need? Yeah, I don't know that we know exactly how much we need, Liz. There's some good research out of Wisconsin showing um, that you're starting to uh, actually pull in some significant amounts of nitrogen starting at about a thousand pounds of biomass. So that's a number that I keep in mind that if you're at less than a thousand pounds of biomass, which looks like a good thick stand to cover crop, you probably don't need to worry too much about a, a lot of nitrogen tie up. And, and I should say that that starts at about 25 pounds. When you get over that thousand pounds of biomass, you might have about 25 pounds of nitrogen tied up in there. So that's one piece of information I think about. Um, and then the reason why we're interested in biomass is because we put a cover crop in the ground in order to have those living roots that feed your soil microbes and that build soil structure. And the more of those you have, the more of those benefits you have. For something like erosion control, you can get away with a, a, a thinner stand for sure. Would you add anything to that, Axel? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, that's awesome. I, I'm really glad that Anna, uh, mentioned uh, the biomass amount that uh, you know, it would be good for us because I've read several uh, uh, publications where they are talking on cover crop biomass that should be more than 6,000 pounds, around actually 8,000 pounds per acre in order to, you know, to be beneficial when we are considering uh, weed growth suppression. Well, this yeah. is the thing. Um, this is a little bit crazy for me because that number is for other conditions. As long as, uh, how, how to put this, I do realize that uh, the more biomass we produce, the better it's going to be uh, the suppression of, uh, of with weeds growth. That's, that's correct. But the thing is that if cover crops uh, need to grow a lot here and need more time for that, so weeds as well. So the, yeah. the point is that uh, I don't think weeds growth rate is as high as it might be in the southern part of the country. So that said, most likely we don't need as much biomass as in the southern uh, locations than the uh, biomass that we need here in the state to in order to, to suppress uh, weed growth. Another thing with uh, biomass production is that as Anna, put it uh, wisely is that if we have a lot of biomass, uh, so basically the amount of nitrogen that was used by the, by the cover crops is uh, uh, linearly related to that, to that amount. I mean, the more biomass, the more nitrogen and eventually other nutrients have been scavenged by the cover crops. Of course, it does not mean that 100% of those nutrients are going to be available back to the cash crop, but a uh, certain amount certainly will be. So, and I would say that uh, I, I like the thousand pounds. I didn't think about that, but uh, based on our results in terms of uh, nitrogen concentration in the tissue of cover crops, is that correct? It, that is correct. We will be having around 20 to probably a little bit less than 30 pounds per acre with a hundred pounds of dry biomass per acre. So that's, that's a good start. And we do have a few more questions about these planting green trials too. Just curious, um, you know, how you were terminating the cover crops. We've done that a couple of different ways if you want to talk about that, Axel. Um, but how are you terminating planting green? Um, and did you use herbicides? You know, and again, we've done a couple of different studies. So if you could talk a little bit on that. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, the probably easiest and uh, easiest way to terminate uh, cover crops when planting green is, is just using a, a herbicide, which is what we have done um, in the first place. So what we do is we go ahead, plant corn or, and or soybeans, and immediately or not later than a day later, we go ahead and spray the, the cover crop. So then cover crop is going to die. Uh, we are going to have a mat of, uh, of cover crop biomass uh, on the ground and the cash crops will come up. Another way is just to mow it uh, right immediately after planting green and then let it go and it will work as well. And it worked well uh, in both uh, 
in both treatments. And actually our mowing was not only mowing, we mowed, we mow it and then we terminate it. Uh, we incorporate it, I'm sorry. And after that, we, we planted the cover crop, was not really a, a, a planting green in that case, but when planting green, it's better to terminate it not later than 24 hours after it has been, the cash crop has been planted. And they're wondering too about testing in dry springs about soil moisture, because, you know, of course this year, I don't know if you did some of the on, uh, on farm work with that too, Anna, but I, I know there was a trial at Lamberton about this as well. Yeah, um, I have a couple things to say about cover crops and moisture here. Um, so this is a, a figure I really from a paper I really like that just came out last year where they looked at cover crops and yield variability. So they're looking at three different positions on the hill slope, the toe slope, the back slope, and the summit. And they're comparing no cover crop to a cover crop and they're looking at corn yield. So here the average yield, you can see this is down in Kentucky, so they have lower yields than us, but they're ranging from you know 100 to 200 bushels essentially at different landscape positions as you'd expect. And then here's the variation. So you can see up here at the back slope in the circle, they have low yields and high variation. And when they added a cover crop to that, they really decrease the yield variation. They also saw a little increase in total yield, but the point is they were able to take out some of that variability that you might see at that part of the landscape. And they attributed that to reduced water stress. Mm. And I think that's probably because of those physical structure benefits of the cover crops, where we actually see that they're able to build soil aggregates that are holding water over the long term. Uh, but there's a push pull there, right? They're building structure that can hold water and they're also taking up water themselves. And so I, I think it just depends on the, the growing conditions and the soil type in terms of which factor is gonna dominate. And then I have a little Minnesota data on the same topic where we're looking in Wasika at some systems with different tillage and cover crops. And what's shown here is the moisture at different soil depths. So from 10 centimeter down to 100 centimeter down to uh, a meter deep in the soil. The two different cover crop treatments are the two shapes here. And then the tillage treatments are the colors. And when you look at the top, it's not too different. Keep in mind, this is starting in April of 2021 and ending over here in September of 2021. Uh, and so early in the year, you know, we weren't really hurting for moisture. And then later we see more of a difference. One interesting thing is that up here on the surface, you can kind of see a difference between the tillage systems more significantly, where strip till and no till are more moist than the rip chisel treatment. And then when you get down deeper in the profile, that's where you can actually see the cover crops taking up some water, I think, where, um, oh no, this is the opposite. This is showing the same thing as that Luthold study, that the rye cover crop, the triangle here is above the circle, which is the no cover. So the rye cover crop is allowing the soil to hold moisture in a way that it wasn't when you didn't have a cover crop in that system. And keep in mind, this is August, the cover crop had been terminated months earlier. So it's a change to the soil structure that's allowing that moisture to be held later in the season. And it's persisting pretty deep in the profile. You see down here though, the uh, rye cover crop treatment has actually taken up more water because that moisture is lower, deeper in the profile. So this is kind of an interesting thing, maybe a better structure on top where the roots have allowed the soil to be held together. And then deeper in the profile, you have your cover crop taking up some water. Like I said, it's kind of pulling in both directions. I don't know if there's anything you've observed at Lamberton, Axel and Liz that would corroborate either one of those stories dominating <laughs> in a wet or a dry season? Uh, yeah, I've done some work on that um, on that topic and actually it pretty much matches what you are showing there, Anna. Uh, the thing is, uh, what we did was we calculated the water use of cedar rye and other in brassica cover crops, uh, mainly uh, camelina and, uh, and uh, Pennycress, but uh, for for uh, cedar rye, which was the, the crop cover crop of our interest, um, and for the other two as well, in the fall, the water use in the fall was very similar, and it, it was pretty low, which matches the amount of biomass that is produced. But the, there were no significant differences. The thing is that the amount of water used by the cover crops in in the fall was 
similar to the amount of water that was lost in our uh, control treatment. The, the control means no cover crop. What does it mean? It means that basically because of the error making those, doing those kind of studies was so high that uh, just the loss of water due to evaporation in the control was as much as the amount of water used in the fall by the cover crops. Now, in the spring, and that's a huge difference. In the spring, the same treatments uh, we noticed uh, and we, we found that uh, cereal rye can use um, more than, uh, let's say, in inches would be close to five inches of water to termination. Okay. And the other two crops use much less, much, much less than that, two to three inches. Hmm. And that's interesting because in a dry year like uh, 2021, that is a problem. So we cannot uh, consider having cover crops too long, uh, you know, in the field. Uh, it, it would be much better to terminate those cover crops uh, probably a couple of weeks before considering uh, planting cash crops. Because another experiment that we have been doing with Liz in Lamberton, we've seen that uh, when we plant cover crops in the spring, uh, in a year like last year, uh, along with corn, let's say at V4, and later, basically, corn is corn yield is also uh, reduced, and uh, the main reason for that is because competition uh, for water, and mm -hmm. so the, which is from more or less what your graphs are are showing, Anna. I like those graphs; are pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, I think that was pretty striking. The trial you're talking about, Axel, where. You terminated and and again this was one site one year you know but where you had the corn and you terminated the cover crop um was it about eight to nine eight to ten days before uh planting the cash crop it was through tillage you right. know and then you used herbicide um was that at at planting correct yep. um yep so then you know we've got that tillage component the study just wasn't that big you know we've been doing this stuff on a shoestring budget so i'm just glad you're able to get that out there but you know, so you couldn't really tell what was the loss from the tillage or what was the loss from the cover crop. But it, you know, that certainly you know, there was a lot of stress on that corn you could see during the growing season where we had terminated, you know, the cover crop at planting. Um, but when you looked at the yield data at the end, you know, it, it didn't really show that so much either. I mean, did it or if you want to fill in on, on that a little bit too but I, I was just surprised I think that tillage to terminate really uh, took out some moisture too. Yeah that's that's right and that's uh, you know a result that it really it was really very interesting as you are saying it looks like basically uh, the cover crop residue that we left uh, you know on, on top of the, on the ground uh, helped to conserve a little bit of water that obviously was used by, by corn I would say that it's a little bit early to conclude on that, but uh, it's encouraging to see that obviously these kind of practices are conserve water, which we already know that. It's just 2021 was uh, an extraordinary year for this kind of research and uh, it's not mm -hmm. good for farmers, obviously, but it helped us to figure out what could happen in, in an extreme situation like 2021 for us. Right. There's a lot of factors. I mean, kind of the general trend consensus is like if it's a dry year, yes, think about terminating earlier. Like if somebody's going to terminate that cover crop, say after planting, and that is more risky. But if you terminate it at planting, generally, you know, especially with soybeans, we, you know, other uh, places that have done this work haven't seen that to have an impact really on soybean. Yeah. Um, but uh, we do have some of, uh, some of the questions that are coming in too. You know, we talked a lot about cereal rye. Um, you know, and of course that's been the go-to cover crop. There's many reasons for that. Most people do that. It's economical, um, readily seed available as well. But just some people are wondering, you know, what about, uh, you know, if you had a multi-species, um, have you done any work on that or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. Uh, the more uh, mixes I have used is uh, three three species. Okay, um, I have used uh, cereal rye or annual rye with uh, crimson clover alone, or with crimson clover and forage radish. That those are the three, and I have done it as well with uh, some brassicas like uh, camelina and pennycress. But this is the thing: uh, there is always the mixing is good. But 
I mean, this is very complex how to put this. For one, I mean, the ratio of disease for each species is not really very clear. There are different methods we can use to do that, but uh, the ratio is very important because most of the time or always, I would say, one of the species is going to be dominant, okay? So for example, uh, we have used uh, forage radish in our three-way three mix and usually forage radish doesn't go very well. I mean, when, when it's mixed, it is probably because uh, our cereal rye or annual rye uh, seeding rate is too high, I would say, uh, or for other conditions like just competition for resources. But we've done that and we've seen that uh, mixes actually produce a little bit more biomass than just monocrop cover crops. That That is a good thing. Uh, but what we have seen is that the total amount of, I mean, the nitrogen concentration of the mix is not that very different to the nitrogen concentration of the cover crop alone. And that puzzles me a little bit because uh, for once, when we do it in the fall, it makes sense because all the cover crops are really tiny, but in the spring, they differentiate in terms of growth and development. And, uh, and our procedures are correct. It's just like, probably you know the total amount of biomass makes the difference but the concentration itself uh is not that different that's but we really produce more biomass yeah that's really interesting axel i wonder do you think it's just that they're just taking up all the available nitrogen essentially and then they they run out and so you get the maximum in any species that you put in i i'm not sure i don't want to attempt to 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 give a guess on that because i am puzzled with that and i am yeah. still looking at the the data and results look good but that's what yeah. uh, i found and in, in that has been in two years and okay. i have much more years to look mm. at yeah okay yeah we're ranging into speculation it's fair to say yes exactly <laughs> but, happens on these events but for sure uh mixes uh seem to produce more biomass than just uh, a monocrop cover crop yeah I know from the weed control standpoint, you know, typically when you look at the research again, the monoculture cereal rye has been very, uh, you know, has, has done very well, you know, but, but again, there's other reasons why you would have multiple species in there too. So um, if you can get them established too, that that's a key thing too, is just getting the establishment, like you said too. Well, yeah, um, and that's a good point because I, I actually, in the list of questions we received uh, before the uh, we started with this, uh, mm -hmm. someone was asking about weeds as, as cover crops, okay? And probably I, I can take a little bit on that. And uh, my, re my response to, to that person would be yes, uh, cover crops, uh, weeds basically could be cover crops. It's just uh, a mix that, uh, you know, our system is receiving it uh, for free <laughs> because we are not spending any money on having those weeds growing there. Uh, but it is, a, it is a good idea, that thing. And I've heard some people talking about it and myself, I have discussed that with other colleagues. Uh, but the thing is that it's very, little research regarding the use of weeds as cover crops. But I would say that theoretically is, is an excellent idea because we are not going to be dealing with whether or not those plants are going to get established. They will come up alone, you know. Uh, but it's very challenging because we know that there are weed resist, uh, resistance to herbicides. And uh, if we don't take care of that, we might just multiply our issues and those kind of things. But I see it like something that we should probably be doing research about. I know we yeah. just got a comment that said, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Right? And, and that's, that's the thing too. I mean, something like giant rag, we very yeah, aggressive. No, no, I don't want and to how are you going to control thing. it? And unless you want right. to sell giant ragweed seed to people, I mean, that's what you'll be <laughs> producing. No, no, no it's, <laughs> but, but it's yeah. interesting. It's an interesting laugh. idea. It's not a good thing. Yeah. But. Well, I think it's relevant to a more benign question I answered in text earlier, which was talking about, you know, the variability and overwintering in certain species. It's just easier to work with a species where you know what's going to happen. And with a field full of weeds that you let grow, you might not know whether you're going to have something that's easier to control with one chemical versus another. And so when you plant a cover crop, you take out some of the worry and stress of not knowing what's going to happen in the spring. You kind of know what your species of weed is going to be. It's going to be cereal rye. So 
Yeah, and and I'll just throw in my two cents worth here too. Being a weed scientist, I mean, weeds have dormancy. You don't know when they're all going to merge. Very aggressive can be can be very more aggressive in your crop too. So I think you're really dealing with fire there if you want to try. I mean, we've had weeds as our natural cover crop, I guess, forever. You know, and and we know how that's gone. So, yeah. <laughs> so but. But yeah, I mean, in theory, they're giving you ground cover. I guess that's it yes. too. But we certainly do not want them to go to seed and no. <laughs> uh, establish in the seed bank because we are having problems already. As but it still, is. it's an interesting thing. I, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah, interesting for ecologists and maybe less. It, that's what I want to say. Ecologists <laughs> might be really very happy with this, but yeah. that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have a question here. It says, would strip tilling into the cover crop allow corn to reach its maximum potential? I, or strategically planting covers and strips and planting corn in between. Any research done with those methods? I don't know if you want to huh. address that. But, I, you know, we've looked at with strip till and cover crops. You know, that has a nice fit. Um, <clears throat> you know, yeah, with it's a corn. Nice combination yeah. of letting yes. you get that prepared seed bed, but still have your ground cover in between. And so they, they do fit really nicely together. They um, do, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we... We did an experiment some years ago, uh, funded by the corn growers. And what we did was um, we inner seeded uh, annual rye grass with uh, alone and combined with crimson clover and forage radish uh, into corn and soybeans. And uh, we had uh, no till, strip till, and conventional till. Well, all those cover crop strategies we used were winter killed. Okay, so we will, we will not have cover crop in the next uh, spring. So because of that, I guess, we did not see any difference in terms of uh, cover crop biomass and uh, none of the treatments uh, regarding the, the, the different uh, till practices and the cover crop strategies affected the yield of corn, of corn and soybeans. So it was just the same. What we saw and is what you, you show, Anna, in your previous uh, soil moisture graphs is that in the no-till and then the strip-till treatments, soil moisture was a little bit higher than in the conventional till. So right. we were able to see that uh, we can conserve more water. Now there's, there's a lot of questions here too that we got in early on about cost and benefits. That's always the holy grail trying to address too. Um, I don't know if you want to share any of this. I know, Anna, you've worked with a lot of different farmers too that have been planting cover crops. If you want to share some of that in, information, what you've been finding so far with them too. And of course, yeah. Axel, I'll let you do, but I'll, I'll shoot that one over to Anna first. Yes, sure. thank you. <laughs> uh, so this is... Uh, all farming systems are so individualized and so personal. So what one farmer values as the highest benefit is going to be different than another. And, uh, but one thing I hear a lot about is that cover crops are changing uh, the logistics of the farm in a way that they like. They're changing exactly what kind of labor you need in the fall. You don't need to do all those fall tillage passes. And they're changing um, the, the way the soil responds to rain. And I'm doing some research on this right now where we are seeing that people who have long-term reduced tillage and cover crop systems, they have different soil structure and it responds differently to the big rains. And people are saying they can get into the field earlier. Uh, we're trying to put some data behind that. I'll put the survey link in the chat too. So if anybody out there is farming and wants to give me some information about how your soil responds to rain, I'm really interested in, in that question. Cause that's an anecdote I hear all the time is that when I plant cover crops you know uh, my soil was so strong that after a two-inch rain the canning company could come harvest sweet corn or I could get out there and chop silage when my neighbor was getting stuck so that's something I hear about a lot as a almost intangible benefit in terms of you can't say that's worth the you know 50 bucks an acre but it seems to really uh, make people enjoy farming more if they feel like they have uh, just a little different kind of control over their system Axel what else have you heard yeah, well, uh, when we talk on the economic benefits of cover crops, uh, basically, I would say that is the most difficult thing uh, because, again, uh, it comes to a point where how can I consistently see that if I am spending money to buy seed and, you know, 
seed, my cover crops and terminate them, is, go, is not going to be a loss uh, for my enterprise. So economics of cover crops uh, probably should be seen uh, uh, in the long term and, and most importantly uh, in our region. But this is the thing, um, an economic study that was conducted uh, by Iowa State uh, University scientists concluded that only, but only really farmers who used cover crops for grazing uh, livestock or forage and received cost share payment tended to have net positive return for uh, in their enterprise. So this is, this is what I think about it. Our neighbors, I mean, Iowa, uh, have a slightly better weather conditions for cover crops growth than we do. Uh, so I will risk saying that the conclusions they have most likely apply to our conditions in Minnesota as well. So what I'm saying is that we, I mean, I mean my, in my research program particularly, I haven't seen yet uh, a consistent economic benefit uh, from the use of cover crops, which does not mean that don't exist. It's just very difficult and it takes more time. What I have seen is that cover crops and, and the way we have used and we have been discussing this morning, cover crops used in corn and soybeans do not affect uh, the yield of those uh, cash crops, okay? So that means uh, terminating just before planting corn and soybeans uh, and planting as early as possible in the fall. Um, We've seen, and I was talking with uh, my colleague in Lumberton, uh, Jeff Strzok, that uh, there, is, there is really a good, and I would say a positive uh, effect on the use of cover crops uh, in, in soil physical characteristics. Uh, but that has taken us seven years to get there, six to seven years, I guess. And we were discussing those results yesterday, uh, in Lumberton. Uh, it was really, you know, really amazing to see those, uh, those improvements in, I would say this is this kind of uh, soil health improvement, but yeah. it has taken us that long to, to see those differences. Now, the point is, how can we make that, those positive changes uh, economic, uh, in, how to say, how can we input that into an economic analysis? I don't know yet, but on the long term, the use of cover crops is positive, yes. Yeah, yeah. and I put some survey data out there that is uh, kind of contradictory to what that Iowa State study shows in terms of... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, well, it just so shows that people who are using cover crops say they're making more money on it. And I think that often has to do with switching to reduce tillage at the same time. Um, Good point. You're, um, you know, reducing those tillage passes, that's a huge savings and can probably cover the cost of your cover crop seed and planting expenses. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, I mean, it's, you're talking long-term benefits, which are very difficult to measure, you know, and I know what first got me interested in cover crops is when we started having, you know, when there's no, so, no snow on the ground, but there's nothing growing out there and it's just windy, you know, and some days, I mean, there's just the dirt's flying. And when people are driving with their flashers down I-90 because we can't see because of a dirt blizzard, you're thinking, <laughs> Okay, this is not good. You know, how do you measure the value of that? I mean, that's very tough to measure, but that stuff happens, you know, and, and so again, that's where, although it's hard to put the pencil and paper together, sometimes uh, there's a lot of benefits, yeah, that we, we do struggle to, um, you know, quantify, but they're, they're still there, that, that just remains that challenge. Um, but I, I have, there's a number of questions coming up here too, some on interseeding as well. You know, would that be an option? You know, we're talking about planting green, um, but, you know, particularly in corn, because again, that's where we see more risk with planting green. Um, maybe you want to share your thoughts on that, Axel. What, what would you think about interseeding if, if that would be a better option potentially than say planting green with corn? Um, and if so, when would you recommend that? Um, well, this is the thing. Uh, I think... Uh, inner seeding works well uh, when compared to seeding late in the season after corn harvest. Uh, we've seen our results show that uh, if you inner seed, you will basically early in the season, you will basically be uh, cons uh, 
significantly increase in the total uh, amount of biomass produced by the cover crops. So the key here is when to intercede. So if you are going to intercede early in the season, uh, uh, you should probably not do it later than V4, V6 corn. Earlier than that, it's going to affect uh, corn yield. And later than that, basically, cover crops are not going to get uh, well established because uh, a competition uh, for light mostly, and then water and nutrients. Uh, I've seen that uh, when we intercede at uh, as late as V8 corn, uh, by time by the time we are harvesting corn, there is not much cover crop under. And the little cover crop that we can see is not enough to, to have a, you know, a, a good uh, ground cover and not to say about biomass production and then going into the next uh, uh, spring. As for soybeans, we can do that as well. Uh, we can intercede, but soybeans, we intercede only at the end of the season because soybeans close canopy very quickly. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, there is no plant that is going to grow in the darkness. <laughs> it's pretty dark on their soybeans, so it's not gonna work. But yes, it works, it works pretty well. And let's see what other questions we have here. We have a lot of questions. We're trying to get these all summarized into key, uh, key groups. One was also about the green bridge, you know, and uh, with concerns again, because we're oh, oh yeah. planning green. Um, and I know, yes, that certainly can be a concern with insects. We have seen like true armyworm being an issue, you know, laying eggs in the, uh, you know, moths come up from the south, they lay their eggs in the, you know, the cover crop, the grasses. If you kill off the uh, grass and the corn's growing right there. They can just move right onto the corn. And, and that has happened in fields, you know, in Minnesota. Um, but, you know, other issues, anything you want to elaborate on that, uh, what you've seen with, with planting green potential, or excuse me, the green bridge issues. Green bridge. Is that me or Anna? <laughs> um, I'll throw it out there to both of you. <laughs> uh, I, I can start if you don't mind, okay. Anna. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, uh, you know, cover crops uh, use obviously concern uh, many farmers. Uh, and most importantly, when it comes to uh, insects that uh, overwinter and uh, migrate along the, the green bridge, moving from cover crop to cash crop, right? That's the thing. Uh, but also because of uh, eventually some diseases and also because uh, we can even talk about weeds. In the spring, however, cover crops are fast growing, uh, so they are green, and uh, it could act as a host uh, plant until the cash crop uh, germinates and gets established. And that's 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 something that we cannot uh, avoid. It will happen. Uh, we here in Minnesota, because our growing season is pretty short, and we want to plant corn and soybeans as early as possible. Uh, the green bridge is not, from what I've seen, a really big problem. We conducted an experiment some years ago, uh, funded by the corn growers, where we had uh, insect traps uh, in, in, in corn uh, when we were seeding early, uh, inner seeding cover crops early in the season. Uh, and we had those traps to try to get non-beneficial and beneficial uh, insects and also above ground and below ground insects. So our results show us basically that we did not see any difference between the control, the no cover crop and the treatments. The treatments were different uh, cover crop strategies. We had annual rye monocrop, an onion rye with crimson clover, and then onion rye with crimson clover and forage radish. None of the cover crop treatments in terms of beneficial and non-beneficial insects was uh, different to what we saw uh, from the control. I do, uh, uh, I do realize that uh, in some places, uh, some people have seen some issues because of the use of cover crops. Myself, I have not seen that. But that's the only study I have conducted. I have to disclose that as well. And it was in yeah. only one location. That was in Lambert. Actually, two okay. in Wasika as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things. I mean, it's not a guarantee, but just there's just more. It puts more risk into the potential It does, risk yes. In the I, I totally and, agree. In, um, it's a valid Iowa, concern. Yeah. Iowa yeah. State had some work done with disease issues, too. Um, and uh, looking at, like, 
Pythium and things like that as well. But right. um, that was focused with corn, I believe, if I, if I recall correctly. But yeah, um, mm. inter interesting work there too. I see we're getting close to the end here too. I don't know if you want to add any more on that or I'll look at some of these other questions. One, I was hoping you could address your Anna just wondering about, you know, I know you've done a lot, a lot of work with carbon sequestration too. Um, you know, and we're talking about different species. Now, it's, do you, have you evaluated carbon sequestration in function of the cover crop type in the soil? So I'm assuming like, have you seen differences by what type of cover crop that you're using? That's gonna likely be much more related to how much biomass you have. If you get over a certain threshold of biomass, then the quality of the material is gonna matter more. You know, whether you have young growing plants that kind of cycle more rapidly into microbes versus older plants that are gonna take longer to break down, that's gonna maybe affect things. But at the threshold of biomass that most people are producing in Minnesota row crops, um, it's it's just all about how much growth you get. Um, again, you know, your carbon coming into the system is all coming in through photosynthesis. And so by growing that cover crop when nothing else is growing, you're increasing the amount of carbon coming into the system. Uh, but that tends to be a pretty marginal amount compared to the amount of biomass that your corn is producing, especially, and also even your, your soybean. So um, the more you can get, the better. But if you're just doing little bits that are good for erosion control, then you're getting more benefit on, on that side. And in terms of sort of, uh, like I said, biological stimulation of what's underground, even if you're not increasing carbon very rapidly with small biomass cover crops. Yeah, all about the biomass. <laughs> um, we do have a comment here. here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Right. Yeah, got a comment here. Fall army one was really bad in areas this fall and winter. Ryan volunteer wheat and oats. Okay, just a comment somebody had here. Um, there's one I see we're at 10 o'clock, but I throw this out real quick. Um, somebody put up here legislative proposals to fund soil health activities, including cover crops, funds to be used for seed seeding, as well as buying equipment. What do you think are the top three activities that should be funded? <laughs> I'll throw that out. This is your chance to make the big plug here at the end. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I just read early this morning that uh, the USDA is going to put aside $1 billion for sustainable cropping, cropping practices in the, in the country. Uh, and I would speculate that uh, a huge amount of that big amount of money is going to go into cover cropping, those kind of things. Well, that being said, uh, so what would be the most important things? Uh, from my perspective, we need to have uh, cover crops that fit the specific locations where we are going to plant them. And that is really very important for locations like in the upper Midwest. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, to be in this safe site, we, we, we can plant uh, cereal rye. And cereal rye is going to go well pretty much most most of the time but i would like to see also you know in a cocktail of cover crops to have uh, a a a legume cover crop that uh, does well and i know that uh, in most of the state probably red clover goes does well and over winters but uh, not all time uh, i would like to see a brassica that does well as well which i don't think exists yet well we have uh, camelina penicress sorry uh, but another type of uh, cover crops and then i would say that uh, we will probably need some specialized equipment for farmers to really uh, do their best to to have cover crops well established uh, and then for termination as well yeah, that's my number one is the equipment question. As I go around and talk to people in particular, people who are excited about doing strip tillage as part mm -hmm. of their cover crop system, getting access to that equipment is mm -hmm. a huge barrier. And I know that the state is considering that and I'm excited about that yep. possibility. Uh, and I think it's gonna require all of us at you know, uh, researchers and local government units and farmers to be creative and co-ops about who owns it and how it's shared so that we can maximize their use on the landscape. Yeah, and totally I'll, agree. Just, I'll just put in my plug. I think there's a lot of things people assume we know, but that we don't know. <laughs> You know, on, with cover crops too. And yeah. there's so many things we don't know. And that, that's, um, yeah, we've done a lot of things on a shoestring budget. And it would be great to have, you know, we do appreciate the fun we've gotten so far, but there's a lot of work, a lot of questions that remain unanswered. And, and I'm sorry we did not get to all the questions today 
here either, but um, we do have our cover crop uh, website. If you want more details on that, we're working on getting more information on there as well. Um, and again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today and thanks to our sponsors, the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council for supporting this today. Um, next week, we'll focus on tar spot of corn. So again, thanks everybody for attending and hopefully see you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. <laughs> yes, yeah. thanks, everyone.